Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club. Uh, it looks like we have a sort of an overflowing uh, crowd here today for our speaker. Uh, my name is James Sims. I'm a contributor to Forbes and a freelance journalist and a member of PAC. Um, as many of you uh, understand um, and know, um, our guest speaker today has uh, been in the press uh, quite a bit uh, over a, a recent uh, spat with a, a major uh, television network, and I think a lot of you want to hear uh, a bit more about that. Um, and also sort of the broader issues of the relationship between uh, a free press um, and also commentators and the government. Uh, there's been a lot of concern uh, that the uh, current administration of Prime Minister Abe is putting a lot of pressure on the Japanese media, TV, newspapers, etc., to toe the government line. You've even had some comments from the head of NHK saying that, uh, you know, that they should not broadcast anything that would be uh, out of line with what the government uh, policies are. And also, um, I was just speaking uh, with Mr. Koga uh, in the anteroom and over lunch, and he has, I guess, some other also broader issues that he wants to talk about today, um, including sort of the lack of a um, organization or movement um, that is not only pro sort of reform and restructuring, um, but also has uh, more of a uh, policy focused on uh, peace. And I think he will address uh, some of that um, in terms of what he's doing now and what he hopes to do in the future. And so I, I don't think I need to go into uh, Mr. Koga's um, CV, but he was a former uh, career bureaucrat at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. And from what I understand was on sort of the fast track to the top, sort of holding key positions. And that was, um, I think, derailed uh, after his uh, sort of proposals to radically reform the Japanese government personnel system. And I think that ran afoul of the then uh, Democratic Party of Japan government. And so I won't go any further than that. Um, and anyway, without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Mr. Uh, Shigeaki Koga. And also, before I forget, our uh, probably our best interpreter, uh, Ms. Uh, Takamatsu. Hello. <laughs> So thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I would, I'm very limited for time, uh, so I'm going to speak about some broad topics. First of all, I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the special uh, position that Japanese broadcasters, in particular Japanese television stations, uh, uh, find themselves in Japan. Uh, in other words, uh, the relationship between the broadcasters and the government. I think this relationship differs from country to country. I would like to talk about uh, some f fundamental uh, information uh, about this topic and give you some of the special characteristics of Japanese broadcasters. So the most fundamental um, information that I would like to give you uh, is that in regard to Japanese television uh, stations, I think the system differs from country to country, as I mentioned earlier. But in Japan, uh, Japanese television uh, stations, broadcasters, fall under the direct jurisdiction of the Somusho, which is the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Internal Affairs and Communication. And as you know, this ministry is part of uh, the cabinet of the prime minister. In other words, uh, the ministry, along with the other uh, ministries, basically uh, follow the general direction uh, that is set by Prime Minister Abe. Uh, so again, to repeat, uh, television broadcasters are under the direct uh, jurisdiction, supervision of uh, the uh, ministry. As a result, uh, they uh, are given licenses uh, to broadcast. These licenses can be uh, taken away. It can also be renewed. So all of this um, means that there's a very close relationship between the government and uh, the broadcasters. So I think the most important thing to point out, again, is that uh, in some uh, countries there may be a slightly different system where uh, the uh, granting of licenses and the revoking of licenses and the renewal of licenses is done by an independent third party, independent from the government. However, that is not the case in Japan. So in that sense, uh, the fundamental nature uh, of uh, the uh, broadcasters is very, very different from the uh, fundamental uh, nature of newspapers and uh, magazines in Japan. Having said this, however, I would also like to add that that does not necessarily mean that newspapers and magazines have free reign. They also are in a rather weak position uh, in regard to the government as well. I would like to clarify what I've just said when I said that newspapers and magazines um, are not necessarily in a strong position uh, regarding uh, the government, is that uh, they fall under what is called the resale system. Uh, what this means is uh, this is a, a national system uh, that, uh, is, that guarantees that um, publications are sold at fixed prices. In other words, that they are not discounted, uh, they cannot be discounted, uh, they have to be sold at the uh, agreed upon retail price. Uh, this system is very beneficial for the newspapers and uh, the magazines. However, 
And I should also add that it is under the jurisdiction of a fairly independent organization, which is the Fair Trade Commission. Having said this, however, uh, there is always the fear among the, or, or anxiety among the newspapers and magazines that uh, this system could be changed in some way. In other words, their prices might somehow be no longer protected in the future. Another uh, reason that the position of newspapers and magazines uh, is not so strong in regard to the government is that uh, there is current discussion about um, uh, the implementation of the consumption tax increase. As you know, it is going to be raised very shortly to 10 percent. And uh, there is a discussion uh, going on in the country about what items will be uh, excluded from the uh, raise in the consumption tax. In other words, uh, goods or products that are necessary for everyday life uh, are supposed to be uh, excluded from that list. And the newspaper and magazine associations are working very, very hard to convince the government uh, to have their products excluded also from the raise in the consumption tax, saying that these are necessary products for our daily lives. In other words, because they are in the process of making this request to the government, that does not, that means that they are not in a position to strongly attack necessarily the government. So, um, what I've been describing is basically the uh, fundamental uh, structure uh, of uh, the uh, relationship between the media and uh, the government uh, in Japan. Uh, and as a result of this uh, structural um, framework, uh, I believe that the media is in a rather weak position in regard to the government. Uh, that is the fundamental background. Uh, going on further with this theme, I think I might have possibly mentioned this the last time I was uh, here in front of you. But in Japan, uh, I believe very strongly that Japan has a fairly high degree of uh, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, the press. I think that uh, democratic values and democratic principles and systems are very f fairly well rooted, deeply rooted in Japan. Having said this, however, I am always thinking about what might happen in the future. I'm wondering if it is possible that even given uh, this high degree of press freedom and freedom of expression, in, in, in spite of the fact that we have great democratic principles embedded in Japan, it, might it be possible in the future for a dictatorship or something approaching a dictatorship to arise in Japan. What I have in mind is not uh, the possibility of a coup uh, occurring, but rather through a process where people follow official procedures and uh, do nothing illegal but follow all of the strict rules, but still manage to eventually create a society which is a dictatorship or very close to a dictatorship. I believe that the first uh, possible step toward uh, such um, a goal would be for the government to um, approach and have uh, deep relationships with the media in uh, uh, in other words, in, on the one hand, apply pressure. And one pressure, of course, is to basically dangle the threat of uh, possibly uh, taking away or revoking the license uh, that the government can give uh, to the broadcasters based on the broadcasting law. Uh, and then also, but also, but uh, offering uh, rewards uh, if uh, they are cooperative, um, as I mentioned. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, the carrot and the stick, or in Japanese we say the candy or the whip. Uh, the candy in this case would be uh, offering newspapers and magazines uh, exemption from the consumption tax increase. So it is this deep involvement where the government approaches the media and tries to get their uh, support. So another uh, a thing that um, I've seen in um, recent um, months, uh, years, uh, that bothers me very much, that causes great anxiety, um, is the fact that the top persons, the top executives in uh, very large uh, mass media companies uh, seem to be coming closer and closer uh, on a personal basis to uh, members of the government. Uh, they seem to be, and the word that is being used is sudiodu, which can be translated as cozying up to or occurring favor with or snuggling up to or trying to become close to uh, with uh, the people uh, in uh, power. Uh, this is a phenomenon that we are, being, we are seeing uh, among many uh, corporate uh, top executives. Uh, and for me, uh, this seems a rather immature way uh, uh, to... Um, to, excuse me, to conduct one's business, but I think that uh, some of these people who are top executives, because they have very close ties now with uh, top members of the government, they feel very proud of themselves. They feel that they are at the heart of power and that they are perhaps actually moving things in the country, that they have uh, uh, great uh, influence, and that uh, they feel privileged and happy to be so close to the heart uh, of power in the country. Uh, the problem uh, with something uh, like this is that if the top executives in a company seem to have that kind of uh, close attachment or close relationships with the government, it directly affects uh, how the people in the field uh, work. 
the people in the field understand uh, fundamental rules of journalism. They realize they're not out there necessarily to battle or cause conflict with the government, but they know that it is their job to look deeply into various topics. And if they find issues that disturb them, it is they know that it is their job to present these issues to the uh, public, even if that creates discomfort for some people. However, they also know that uh, if some of the issues that they present to the public might cause the government uh, or people in power to become um, rather upset, the question that they must ask themselves is, will my corporate executives protect me or will they come down on me hard? And uh, the fact uh, is that they understand that uh, because uh, they uh, might not necessarily be protected by uh, the, their top um, executives, they're basically holding back. It's a kind of a self-restraint that we're seeing. Excuse me, the interpreter forgot one part, uh, the first part of this, this section. Um, I've been talking a little bit about um, the fact that right now we're seeing a lot of pressure and um, offerings of rewards being given uh, to the media now. But the question that uh, remains is how does the media respond? Uh, it's unfortunately what we're seeing in Japan nowadays is that we're so, we're not seeing the media fight back, uh, but rather we're seeing the media basically trying to accommodate the pressures uh, and the system of rewards that are being directed their way. What that means is that when individual reporters and producers, etc., have a story and they have many many things to say, they kind of pull back and don't say everything that they want to say because they want to try, if possible, to have a smooth relationship uh, with the government. So again, the first step is that the government applies pressure, offers rewards. The second step is that the government does nothing further, but the press on its own basically holds back, self-restrains itself. I've talked about the first step and the second step of this process, and, and as an example of the second step where we're seeing the self-restraint on the part of the media, I would like to give you one particular example. Uh, the interpreter does not the, know the exact translation of this, uh, excuse me, this, the title of this organization, but it is basically a labor union, a confederation of labor unions of uh, employees working for uh, private or commercial broadcasting companies, and recently they uh, issued a declaration basically protesting uh, the situation in which they are finding themselves. They are protesting against the pressures that they're feeling from uh, the government, from uh, also the LDP. Uh, from my point of view, it's amazing that they had not issued a declaration until now, but uh, what I would like to point out is that uh, in the wording of this uh, release, uh, which I seems to be uh, available to the public, uh, is that uh, there is... Um, uh, a complaint basically being expressed about uh, corporate executives, uh, high executives of the um, broadcasting companies and also people in the high uh, staff, excuse me, um, high ranking personnel in the editorial departments of these organizations who seem to very proactively seek opportunities with Prime Minister Abe to play golf together or to have meals together. Uh, and uh, there is a protest expressed uh, in this statement because uh, at the same time the people on in the field uh, on on site, uh, working uh, every day, gathering the news and putting together the news programs are feeling tremendous pressure uh, from uh, government and from uh, power organizations about holding back on their reporting. Uh, the reason I bring this up is not to point out something extraordinary or funny or, or, or strange. Uh, this is something that you might not see in another country, but what I'm pointing out to you is that the, p the fact that these kinds of phrases were included in the statement is an indication of just how tough the people in the field are feeling uh, their work uh, to be nowadays, uh, that they began to question uh, their executives, why are you doing this when we are facing such pressure, is the message that they seem to be trying to send. As you know, um, part of the reason that I'm getting so much uh, attention at present is that on March 27th, given this entire background of the first and second step uh, uh, taking place uh, in Japan right now, on March 27th, uh, there was a live uh, broadcast of the program that I often uh, acted as commentator for, which is Hodo or Broadcast Station. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there was one message that I wanted to uh, say on the program, and I even actually prepared a flipboard, a, a board, uh, to try to um, talk about it, but because we got um, diverted into a, a, a rather silly uh, little argument. Uh, I was asked uh, to put away the, the flipboard or the, uh, the um, board uh, because we ran out of time. So I'd like to talk about what I wanted to say on that program. So the uh, thing that I wanted to um, explain was that I wanted to give you, I wanted to give the audience uh, at that time uh, some uh, important, uh, excuse me, some important uh, 
uh, examples of the fact that because of the self-restraint that we're seeing on the part of the press uh, in recent years, uh, there has been a phenomenon now in Japan where broadcasters do not really uh, uh, convey to the public important news, or even if they do uh, convey important news, it is on a very, very small scale. They do not really um, broadcast it uh, in a very full or detailed manner. And I wanted to actually, on my last flipboard, uh, to give you to give the audience uh, several examples of where I saw uh, these things occurring. Uh, because of uh, the lack of time, I'm just going to focus on one of these examples. Uh, and uh, this uh, example has to do with the fact that, um, as you know, Prime Minister Koizumi, during his administration, implemented many, many different kinds of reforms. And some of the reforms uh, involved uh, the privatization of uh, f uh, state financial institutions, very, very large and powerful state financial institutions. And uh, one of the um, ideas was uh, that one of the rules or th uh, that had been decided was that there would be a certain uh, deadline by which uh, these organizations uh, would would, uh, financial institutions would be um, privatized. Uh, and for example, I'm sorry, the interpreter has uh, not looked up these uh, <laughs> names of organizations immediately, so perhaps members of the audience can help the interpreter. One is the Seisakuto Shiginko, which is the the Development Bank of Japan, yes, I'm sorry, they changed their name, the Development Bank of Japan, and also the Shokochu King, there was Emesika, which is like the, does, does someone know? Sorry, uh, it has a, a little translation. It is uh, basically um, a kind of a cooperative uh, financial institution uh, that caters to small and medium enterprises. Uh, the reason is, uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, that these concern me is that, as I said, uh, there was a deadline by which these um, organizations were to be privatized. However, uh, one of the bills that is being presented uh, to the Diet right now is that uh, this deadline will be extended. And if that uh, bill passes, maybe even completely eliminated, Mm. Uh, there's a possibility that there will be no um, deadline at all. In other words, that they will, these institutions will continue to be state-owned, uh, and in fact, the privatization reforms will not take place at all. Uh, if something like this had happened during the uh, administration of the, of the Democratic Party, I think the media would have pounced upon this issue and would have broadcast it in a very, very major way. However, we're seeing almost no news uh, about uh, this very, very important uh, development. Also, uh, we're seeing that uh, there are other uh, privatizations of uh, um, major financial institutions uh, and there have been tremendous changes in the past two years since we've seen uh, Prime Minister uh, admi uh, Abe's administration uh, take power. Um, there are four uh, major financial institutions that are going to be privatized. Originally, uh, it was that uh, the, the top executives would be from the private sector. However, now three of those posts have been basically promised to top uh, former bureaucrats, uh, bureaucrats of the vice minister or administrative vice minister uh, class. In other words, what, what we're seeing is a revival of the Amakudari uh, or the uh, cushy uh, retirement job from the bureaucracy after relieving the bureaucracy uh, system that the reformists have tried so hard to fight. So again, um, I thought uh, this was a very, very important issue and I wasn't sure of the cause. Uh, was it because there was government pressure to hold back on the reporting or was it that uh, there was self-restraint on the part of the mass media, uh, in, a, in other words, the TV stations? Because I did not know the answer to the question, I uh, met with many people in the television broadcasting companies to ask uh, what they thought. And what surprised me and it was very, very shocking to me was that mm, many of the people that I spoke to didn't even realize that these were important issues. They just simply didn't know uh, that these were important news items that they should be following up on. And that's a situation that five years ago would have been unimaginable. Uh, they knew about these issues, but uh, they didn't understand or they didn't fully realize the impact or how important uh, these issues were. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that I think we're very fast uh, reaching what I would call a crisis situation in, in regard to the media. As I mentioned, it is a gradual step-by-step oh, -step process. The first step is where the government offers rewards and pressure, applies pressure to the uh, media. The second step is where the uh, uh, press responds, the media responds to that pressure and the system of rewards by basically holding back, uh, 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 practicing self-restraint on their reporting. But the third step is where perhaps we are now entering, and this is the frightening step. The reason for this is that uh, the press or the mass media are exercising self-restraint on their reporting, but they're not even aware, they don't have the consciousness that they are um, exercising this kind of self-restraint. Uh, In other words, this goes to the heart of what a journalist is, the most important ability or talent 
talent or a function of a journalist is first of all to be aware uh, that something is wrong, that there is an issue, that is a, there is a problem, and then to have the courage and ability uh, to follow up and dig deeper uh, and do investigative journalism. But I think that ability, first of all, to be aware of important issues and to also follow up on them is being lost. So, um, in order to uh, emphasize uh, these uh, points that I've just made, um, I wanted to show my very, very last um, board uh, on uh, the, my last appearance on this uh, Hodo Station program. And uh, I will, on that board, I had uh, the uh, quotation uh, in Japanese, unfortunately, if, um, the words of uh, uh, Gandhi. And I'm sorry, I don't have the actual English uh, translation, but it basically means. Um, the things that you do, whatever you do, may seem insignificant to you, but it is most important that you actually do them. The reason it is important that you actually do them is not that you can necessarily change the world, but it is important that you do these things that are important to you so that the world does not change or alter you. So uh, the conclusion that I would like to uh, make is that uh, so far I've been talking about the relationship of the uh, media to uh, the government, but now I would like to talk about the fact that we're seeing a similar kind of situation uh, uh, in uh, um, become apparent uh, among the general public. Of course, the government cannot apply direct pressure to the uh, general public, but uh, if the general public is not given uh, access to uh, a great deal of information, of real information, uh, by uh, the media which is exercising self-restraint, then uh, eventually the kind of information that the general public will receive uh, is basically information that is convenient for the powers, uh, the people that are in power. In other words, they are, without knowing it, the people are going to be perhaps brainwashed. As a result, uh, even though we will continue to have uh, democratic elections, which of course elections are the most important and come to the heart of democratic um, systems, even though they do go, because they do not have uh, the correct information, they quite often may make the wrong choices. And as a result, we may see a dictatorship. And of course, I would not say that we would really actually ever see a dictatorship arise in Japan, but something close to a dictatorship might um, become uh, a reality in Japan. Of course, I would also like to add that my personal hope and my personal uh, expectation is that th something will stop this process and we will not ever get to that point. So um, this uh, concludes my uh, first part of the speech, which is basically uh, is my uh, view on the relationship between uh, the broadcasters and, uh, and the um, powers in government. Uh, but I would also like to take this opportunity to talk about one other thing um, that uh, is causing me some concern, which is that we're seeing a kind of strange, perhaps I would refer to as propaganda. Uh, it has to do with one of the activities that I have recently begun, and I would like to therefore clarify uh, some misunderstandings uh, about this activity. So about a month ago, I started uh, a new sort of campaign or an activity called Forum 4, and the number is 4. So you can look that up um, if you Google it. And uh, among the people uh, that are criticizing me, and I have been subjected to a great deal of criticism uh, in recent months, uh, some people are saying that um, I have started this activity as a way for me to eventually start a political party, in other words, to start some kind of a political movement. And I would uh, therefore uh, like to be very, very clear about this. This is not uh, the starting of any kind of a political organization or some kind of a political movement, but rather it is simply a citizen's, regular citizen's movement. And the goal of this Forum 4 is to try to counter uh, what we're seeing in society, uh, this uh, uh, a situation where um, every time elections are held, there are fewer and fewer voters uh, that go, um, and also that we're seeing the number of people who are not affiliated with any um, political party grow. And I do not take a negative view about this development. I do not think that uh, it's, it sh shows that most people don't care or have no interest uh, in elections, but rather, I think it is an indication that many people do care about elections, do care about who uh, they elect, but they cannot find a political party or a politician that they truly would like to support. So I am running out of time, so I'd like to explain in very, very simple terms uh, what uh, this uh, Forum 4 is trying to do. Um, I believe that when we look at the political parties that exist in Japan right now, uh, we can divide them in uh, two different ways. One is that, uh, first of all, we want to see where their policies lies. Uh, one, uh, 
a way that you can divide the political parties is are they in favor of reform and are they of structural reform and are they really serious about trying to implement structural reform? And the way that we can divide the existing political parties is uh, whether they follow the traditional uh, path uh, that we've seen in Japan for many, many years of basically holding on to peaceful policies or if they are taking uh, the new uh, road which is more hawk-like. Uh, in other words, represented by uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, and his policies. He refers to his policies as proactive pacifism, but I personally think that it's rather proactive militarism. Uh, so again, we have these uh, f maybe two di uh, divisions here and two divisions here, and two times two is four, so we have these four different groups. Um, but I don't think that there is any group of people uh, or any political party or any politicians that try to take uh, the middle road, uh, which we would very much like to uh, promote, which is that on the one hand, they very much want to be serious about implementing structural reform, but they do not want to do it in a hawk-like way, uh, the way Mr. Prime, the way Mr. Abe is trying to do. In other words, uh, to put it very, very simply, uh, they want reform, but they don't want war. I don't think there's any political force uh, in Japan that really focuses on these two um, aspects. And basically, this movement is a citizen's movement asking uh, politicians, do you favor this? And if, you, if so, identify yourselves by raising your hands. Um, perhaps eventually a political party will be formed with these fundamental policies as their uh, center. But right now, this is simply a citizen's movement. Thank you very much for your attention, and I would like to take your questions. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for sort of framing, um, I guess, the recent issue that you had with um, the, uh, the broadcast network. Um, anyway, I would like to take questions uh, from the working press. Um, if you could please state your name and affiliation. Uh, keep it to one question. I think we'll probably have a fair amount of questions. Maybe we can get to a second round. And no speeches. Uh, Richard Lloyd. Oh, and I, I saw your recent, uh, I think, spat with one of your uh, Twitter followers. <laughs> Richard Lloyd, Power of the Times, thank you. Uh, it's clear that there has, within the Japanese government, been a shift towards the conservative nationalist right. Uh, and also, it's, it's notable that within the LDP, the moderate wing of the LDP seems to be an eclipse. But I wanted to ask you whether you think that's just a change within the government, or does it also reflect a shift in Japanese public opinion at the grassroots. In other words, have Japanese people moved to the right, or is it just that there is no credible force and opposition on the left? Um, I think uh, among the general population, uh, there have been people who have uh, been very close to Prime Minister Abe in terms of uh, ways of thinking. In other words, uh, there has, of course, been a long tradition in Japan of uh, being of people being uh, very uh, committed to pacifism and being very liberal, but also there have been people who have been more hawk-like in their fundamental uh, thinking. And again, we have also to take into account uh, the fact that the international environment is changing. China is rising. Uh, and in fact, uh, to quote the words of uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, uh, because of the changes in the international environment, it is perhaps only natural that uh, Japan must rethink its diplomatic and uh, security policies. Uh, and But uh, I would like to also point out that uh, these security issues uh, have not really been a huge uh, point of contention in Japanese society since perhaps the 1970s when uh, the uh, Japan Security, uh, Japan-U.S. Security Pact uh, was being um, uh, revised or renewed. Uh, for many, many years, it was not uh, something that was widely debated, but with the rise of Prime Minister Abe and the establishment of his administration, this has now become a very great point of debate. And in response to that, I believe the people who stand on the other side, the people who stand on the side of pacifism, have also begun to raise their voices in a very strident way. In other words, both sides are raising their voices and uh, debating this issue. Uh, the, the, uh, and I would like to clarify, um, I uh, think it is absolutely fine uh, that uh, this kind of debate is taking place. Um, I do not see that there's any problem with uh, the numbers of supporters of Prime Minister Abe's policies increasing in numbers and increasing in the level of their uh, speaking out. Uh, and I don't think it's a problem that, of course, if you stand from a very liberal uh, point of view, th you may consider it a problem. But taken uh, overall, uh, looking at society from the point of view of freedom of expression, uh, having a very strong democratic principles, it is only natural and healthy for society to have very, very strong uh, debates about issues, for people to take very strong positions and, and uh, speak out uh, for their beliefs. There's nothing wrong with that kind of debate, but what I am concerned about is the fact is, are we securing an environment where this kind of 
uh, open and strong debate is truly possible. In other words, right now, uh, Japan is uh, considering huge policy shifts. Uh, being, big changes are being taken uh, into consideration. And at that time, is there enough information that is being given uh, to the public, all correct information given to the public, so that people can truly debate these issues in a fair and open way? That is my concern. Uh, Justin McCurry from The Guardian. Uh, I think there's a clear difference between a government or a political party simply wanting its views fairly represented in the media and putting undue pressure on, on journalists. And frankly, I'm not convinced by your one example um, of the possible privatization of the state-owned financial institution. So I'm hoping you can give us a couple more concrete examples of what you see as undue pressure being placed on networks newspapers or, or individual journalists to write about issues in a certain way or in fact not to write about them at all. Thank you. So um, I would like first of all to clarify uh, that uh, the example I gave of not being able to talk about the um, privatization of financial institutions uh, on uh, my uh, spot on Hodo Station, uh, I did not uh, refer to that um, point as an example of my being, for example, uh, um, being uh, put under uh, pressure uh, by the government. Uh, that's not what I meant at all. I meant that I wanted to speak about it, but I didn't have time because we got uh, distracted or diverted into um, a kind of silly argument. Uh, but I think uh, in regard to your question, I think a very well-known example of the kind of pressures that we're seeing uh, applied uh, to the media is that um, before the election, and I think you kind of referred to it, uh, as you know, the LDP uh, sent uh, letters uh, to uh, the heads of uh, large broadcasters uh, in, uh, based in Tokyo. Tokyo, big television companies. And uh, on the surface, it looked like just a general set of um, things to please be careful of uh, when broadcasting news about the upcoming uh, general election. And uh, of course, uh, from a very, very detailed legal point of view, you could look at that document and say that you could not necessarily say that it is an example of applying undue pressure. Uh, having said this, however, how was that document, uh, this request by the LDP to the television stations to treat uh, all of the news in a fair and equitable uh, uh, manner uh, before the elections, how was that paper treated uh, in, uh, by the different uh, television companies that received that document? Um, many years ago, it might have been that, first of all, the television stations would say, look to the public, uh, we have received this kind of a document, what do you think? Or it might have been that uh, this is ridiculous and, and they might have just ripped it up and thrown it away in the trash. But I spoke with people from different uh, television stations and there was no one uh, that said that the document had just been ripped up at all. But rather, the document was um, copied and uh, distributed uh, to all of the uh, departments uh, that would be involved in the news reporting of the upcoming elections. Of course, there was no attached document that said in writing, because we received this document, you must practice self-restraint or anything like that. But uh, certainly, uh, being given uh, this kind of document uh, and also being told, you know, we should be careful, uh, is a kind of way to apply pressure to the people uh, on the uh, in the field. I, I don't think you could get away from uh, interpreting uh, it in that way. And uh, not only uh, is this an example uh, of something that is disturbing. What is more disturbing is that uh, this fact that uh, the LDP distributed such a document was not reported by the media for a very, very long time. In fact, the news uh, came to light uh, not on the uh, commercial broadcasters' airwaves, but because uh, on the internet, a journalist without borders uh, showed a copy of this uh, document. In spite of this, however, the broadcasters basically have been trying to hide uh, this document. And the reason for that is because they fear repercussions from uh, the LDP. So. Uh, Another thing uh, that, again, was not uh, broadcast uh, by the uh, commercial broadcasters, excuse me, was that um, the journalists uh, without borders uh, made another scoop. No borders, uh, journalists with, uh, with no borders. Just called No Borders, I'm sorry, I thought it was a longer name. Uh, the No Borders uh, Association uh, said uh, that, uh, uh, gave information uh, that another letter had been uh, sent, and uh, this basically um, pointed out, uh, it was uh, basically uh, directed toward the producer of this program that I was on, uh, the Hodo Station uh, broad, uh, show, and it referred to a specific date and a specific video that had been shown on that uh, date uh, during that news program. And the video basically uh, focused on abenomics and the results of abenomics, and the tone of the video was that abenomics is basically favoring only or um, favoring only the rich or is only uh, benefiting uh, the wealthy uh, and uh, the tone
I'm sorry, the uh, clarification is that it's not that the video did not say that uh, the Abhinagan mix was only benefiting the rich, but the emphasis of the video was that the rich or wealthy are benefiting a great deal from abenomics. Uh, in spite of this, however, uh, this was apparently something that uh, did not please uh, the powers, uh, people in power, and uh, basically there was no specific uh, scolding uh, in uh, the uh, communication, but they, the request was that you do your work properly would be the uh, perhaps the direct translation. Uh, and again, this kind of uh, complaint or this kind of um, notification coming uh, to the television broadcaster, again, this was not disclosed to the public until No Borders showed it. I, I think you had mentioned something uh, uh, during the lunch uh, about the LDP having a meeting tomorrow uh -huh. on uh, broadcasters and I think the mass media. Uh, um, in regard to this point, um, I think it's already been, um, uh, information about this has already been distributed and people already know about this. I have not seen any specific document in regard to this uh, uh, matter. However, uh, it is uh, apparent that uh, the there is a subcommittee within the LDP that handles broadcast-related matters, and they have invited or directed to come, uh, asked uh, the people responsible uh, to come from two television stations, TV Asahi, and the subject that will be uh, discussed at that meeting for TV Asahi is my appearance on that uh, Hodo station program on March 27th in the, in the comments that I made uh, during the live broadcast. And uh, the other people that are uh, coming are um, representatives from NHK. Uh, there is a, a news program called Close Up Gendai, or Close Up Modern Times, uh, which is shown at 7.30 uh, in the evenings, uh, almost every day. Uh, and uh, there is now a scandal uh, that uh, about this program, where there seems to have been a program that was presented as real fact, and that there seems to have been some fabricated um, aspects of that program. So um, again, uh, the uh, people responsible from the two television stations have been asked to come to speak uh, at uh, the LDP or to answer questions by this LDP subcommittee. Because it is the LDP, because it is the ruling party, the TV stations are reluctant or are, are too fearful of saying no. If it had been another political party that had instructed them to come and talk to them, they might have said no. But uh, because it is the LDP, and the LDP is basically uh, very closely as associated with or almost equivalent to the uh, ruling government, uh, the uh, TV stations uh, cannot uh, turn down this request. And when they are presented with many, many questions or given uh, advice or instructions, they will not be able to truly uh, fight back or uh, express very strong op opinions in opposition to what is being said to them. Um, I think the word that I would say is that what we're going to be seeing in this meeting is basically a kind of mass lynching and everyone laughed at this. Of course, it will not be anything uh, as uh, of, as overt, I guess, uh, or as obvious as a mass lynching, I think uh, on the surface, uh, the words that will be used will be very, very polite and very, very respectable, and the questions will be very, very detailed and very, very finely handled. But the fundamental uh, impression that the TV stations will receive is that they will feel a, a great uh, pressure. And I would like to say that uh, the fact that the ruling party uh, has called uh, people responsible for um, programming of uh, programs in a commercial television station. The fact that they are calling these people is, I think, a direct violation of the broadcast law. When we talk about the broadcast law, quite often nowadays we talk about Article 4, or politicians especially like to talk about Article 4, which ensures that broadcasters must give fair and just um, uh, neutral uh, broadcasting. Uh, but what is more important, I think, is Article 3, and uh, the interpreter does not have the exact wording uh, for uh, what uh, Mr. Koga just read out loud, but basically uh, it says that if a broadcaster uh, is broadcasting something that does not go against um, established laws, then uh, no outside party has the right to uh, intervene or to um, monitor or, 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 or in any way interfere with that kind of broadcasting. So I'm saying that this um, being called by the LDP to explain their actions goes in violation of Article 3 of the broadcast law. I uh, personally hope very, very much that uh, and wish that the people at TVSI and NHK uh, would basically turn down this request by the LDP to explain their actions. And I wish that they would say to the LDP that if you do want to discuss this issue, then please feel free to come and visit our offices and we will put you in a studio and we will have cameras rolling and we will have our discussion live for the general public. 
Siegfried Knittel, <coughs> freelancer from Germany. You talked about um, possible pressure on the resale system of the, on the newspapers. How can the government influence this system? I think it's, it's a, uh, a system created by the newspapers. How can the government put pressure in, in, this, in order to change this, this uh, resale system? The other question is, you're a former, you're a former bureaucrat. You get a, a state pension. Do you, know, do, do you not fear the government could uh, cut your pension? <laughs> In regard to your first question, uh, it is true, as you've pointed out, that the uh, resale system uh, was basically um, agreed upon by uh, the major newspapers and magazines. Uh, in other words, uh, they are able to apply pressure or force uh, the stores that handle their products to maintain a certain minimum retail price. Uh, however, uh, if a normal company t tried to do that, uh, that would go against the anti-monopoly law. In other words, it would be an illegal thing. However, there is a special uh, proviso within the anti-monopoly law that allows for newspapers and uh, magazines uh, to be exempted from the anti-monopoly law. So the threat uh, exists that the government could uh, remove that special exemption uh, status for newspapers and magazines, in which case the stores would be able to discount uh, these newspapers as much as possible and uh, the uh, newspapers and, and magazine uh, companies would see their uh, profits decline. It's a it could have a huge uh, impact on their bottom line. Uh, yes, as you've pointed out in regard to pensions, because I was uh, uh, a former civil servant, of course, yes, I do receive a uh, pension. And uh, compared to the uh, people, uh, there are people in Japan, of course, who uh, do not receive pensions. I believe I'm in a very favorable uh, situation. And as long as I don't try to live a luxurious, uh, you know, try to follow a luxurious lifestyle, I can manage uh, because of my pension. And uh, as a result, I don't necessarily have to try to cozy up to the government or try to uh, basically... Um, practice self-restraint and this, this is all perhaps because I do uh, have uh, this pension. I'm very grateful for it. I would also like to, however, uh, point out that uh, uh, the uh, regular employees or the official employees of the television stations receive much higher salaries than civil servants and they also receive much um, uh, better pensions uh, than uh, we do. Uh, at the same time, however, when you look at a, a television station, and I looked at the staff of the Hodo station program where I often worked, uh, a great many people uh, are not official or regular employees of these stations, but rather they are uh, dispatched temporary workers, many of them working on six-month contracts with no guarantee that those contracts will be renewed. And so... Um, not only that, but the salaries that they are receiving are very, very low. Uh, it is not only it is not that you sometimes find people who receive half the salary of a regular employee of a television station, even though they're doing the same they are doing the same work. But rather, that is more or less the norm. Most of these temporary workers do the same work as the regular employees, but they receive, on average, less than half of the salaries, and they receive no company pension uh, as, as as well uh, if they are if they lose their jobs. As a result of these low salaries, uh, they have very little in terms of savings. And so if a person uh, working uh, in under these conditions wants to pursue the nuclear power plant issue or something that might uh, uh, not make the government happy, uh, if they are, however, um, faced with the risk that six months later when their contract comes up for a renewal, they might not get a job, that is very difficult for them. Um, in fact, I already know several people who have lost uh, their jobs as of April of this year. They're working under very, very difficult conditions, again, with very little uh, money. And so it's very difficult for me, uh, given my current situation, to say to them, you must be strong, you must be brave, and you must con you know, continue to create um, pro programs and not bow to pressure. I can't say that to them because they're struggling day to day. Uh, but I think at least for the regular employees of uh, the television stations, which have a very nice salaries, who have very nice salaries, and a very enhanced or enriched um, pension uh, plans waiting for them, I think at least they should stand up. Okay, yeah, Michael. And also, um, we've had a lot of questions from foreign correspondents. I'm going to turn any members of the Japanese media press that might ask questions. Please uh, come up. Uh, Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News. Actually, the moderator uh, asked the main part of my question, which was about the LDP hearings uh, in which the TV Asahi executives were called in. So I'll just do what would have been my last part of my question which is that uh, this was posed to Chief Cabinet Secretary Suga yesterday in a press conference. He was asked about this case, and his response was, this is absolutely not pressure, and that it's no problem at all. And so I wanted your reaction to that. How should we as journalists interpret the denial 
uh, by the Chief Cabinet Secretary that this represents any kind of pressure whatsoever on the media? Um, if uh, you were a member of the Japanese media, I think you would take the words of the uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary and the word that is being used is Chief Cabinet Secretary Sama, which means the Honorable Chief Cabinet Secretary, and just print uh, his words uh, at verbatim that it is not pressure at all. However, I think of the people who were in the uh, press conference, there were no journalists that actually took those words literally and uh, that uh, they did not really truly believe that there was no pressure uh, being uh, applied. Um, I think uh, that... Uh, People who are in positions of power, who have great uh, influence, uh, must fundamentally understand that their words carry much more weight, that the quality of their words is very, very different from the quality of the words and the weight of the words of the average person. Um, I think there are many members of this current government, however, who do not understand uh, this fundamental difference. For example, Prime Minister Abe, uh, when he was uh, embroiled in a debate uh, in uh, the Diet, uh, basically countered some of the criticisms uh, given to him by saying, um, what's wrong with some of the things that um, I say? After all, I'm a an individual and I have the right to freedom of expression. Uh, in other words, uh, there are people in the government who do not simply un seem to understand the fundamental tenets of uh, constitutionalism. Um, and as I said earlier, Article 3 of the Broadcast Law uh, prevents uh, the intervention uh, by uh, government or organizations uh, in power and they do not seem to understand that. Um, I think people in uh, government of course, I should also uh, qualify that if this meeting uh, that, that is being called tomorrow is were being called by the government, I think that would be another issue entirely. The government is a legal entity, and they have the right to call uh, uh, such um, uh, TV Asahi and NHK representatives if they think there is some kind of a social uh, issue there. However, tomorrow's meeting is not being called by the government, but, but but by the LDP, a political party. And although they do not say it directly, they know very much that they are the ruling party and they show it uh, in their stance and in their attitude and they know that it is on the basis of their being the ruling party that they have the power to call these people to come to the meeting uh, tomorrow. They say, of course, again, uh, we're only going to discuss uh, Ginon or debate uh, this issue. We're only going to ask uh, questions. But uh, everyone in the room will understand that behind uh, their words is the... Uh, the hanging threat of the fact that uh, the television uh, stations have licenses uh, that uh, have licenses that have been given on the basis of the broadcast law, and these licenses could possibly be endangered. Um, I would very, very um, much like to point out that uh, people who apply pressure don't necessarily recognize that they're applying pressure. It's a little bit like bullying. People who bully other people don't realize that they're bullies. It's not what you, uh, the bullier or the person applying pressure thinks, it's what the other side uh, perceives. If the person thinks that they're being bullied or the person feels that they're being pressured, then there is pressure or bullying uh, going on. Um, I think that this is the fundamental understanding that needs to be had by members of the government. Uh, that, And I think that uh, if they had this kind of understanding, they would show much more consideration and be more circumspect in the words that they use. Uh, and. I also believe that if we are, are going to take the words of uh, Chief Cabinet Secretary um, literally and there is no pressure being applied, then I think the broadcaster should be able to speak freely and say, there's no pressure being applied, we don't have to go to this meeting, uh, and so we can cancel tomorrow's meeting. I uh, said earlier that the, uh, there's no problem if it were the government that we're calling tomorrow's meeting, but I would like to clarify that there's more, more of an explanation to that. If on the basis of um, some kind of a law, uh, the government felt it had uh, under had a right uh, to call uh, the uh, television stations to come to a meeting uh, t uh, to speak with members of the government, if they did that based on law, uh, based on the authority of the law, and based on um, proper procedures, then I think that would be proper. Um, I'm not by any means uh, saying that the government has the right to call any member of a broadcaster station because they have trouble with or they disagree with contents of programming. I'm not saying it's a, it's a simple thing like that. Okay, I'm going to ask questions in Japanese. I know video news on Jimbo. I'm Jimbo of uh, Video News. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, this problem of the broadcast law and the granting of licenses. Uh, it's kind of an it's a, in Japan, uh, this granting of uh, the broadcasting license uh, by the government directly uh, is rather unusual um, as a system uh, in the world. I mean, for example, it's very different from the kind of system that we have um, in the FCCJ. But um, the fact that uh, the 
certainly, uh, I can understand the point of view of the ruling party not wanting to change the system because, uh, in other words, to prevent uh, government or the powers uh, uh, from uh, intervening in the workings of um, broadcasters and uh, other media. But even if the ruling party doesn't want to change, why don't other people speak up? In other words, the opposition parties and maybe the media uh, themselves, the people in the media themselves, or perhaps uh, civil uh, civic organizations, uh, uh, people's uh, action groups. Uh, this is an unusual system, and even with the problems that you have encountered uh, recently, and this being news, there doesn't seem to be a movement to try to change the current system of the government directly granting uh, the uh, license to the media companies. Sorry. Um, I think that uh, there are uh, several uh, different uh, reasons uh, for this. Uh, first of all, the fact that, uh, as I've explained to you, uh, the media is holding back from uh, reporting everything. So from the point of view of the average person uh, in the street, they... Um, unless the media gives them the information uh, about what is going on and gives, gives this kind of background information, they don't understand it, that there is some kind of a conflict. conflict. So they have no way of uh, uh, getting access to this kind of information. Um, and since uh, there are two parties involved, the media on the one hand and the government uh, on the other, and we're talking about the relationship between the two parties, certainly from the government's point of view, they don't want this uh, kind of information to be made public. They won't uh, volunteer this kind of information. And if the media uh, does not... Uh, work up the courage and say, we will fight and we will do everything we can to uh, battle the government and try to um, change this system, unless they make that kind of a, a, a huge decision, again, the average person uh, cannot know about this issue at all. And that's why I think there is no movement or um, uh, any um, efforts to try to change this current system. Um, I believe that also there is another aspect, which is that, uh, and I won't say all large medium companies, but I think um, most uh, large media companies in Japan, uh, if you uh, look at them, uh, they are closer probably to the heart of government, the heart of power, rather than uh, to the average person on the street. Um, if you look, for example, at broadcasting stations, uh, the, uh, there's only a certain amount of bandwidth or frequencies that are available, and uh, there are these major companies that basically dominate them. It's basically like an uh, oligopolistic relationship, if the interpreter is getting that word right. Uh, in other words, there are only a few uh, parties that are dominating the entire field. On the one hand, uh, it makes them weak when they are trying to deal with the government. But on the other hand, it puts them in a very advantageous position in terms of potential rivals. Uh, they are very, very powerful. They don't really want to change uh, the system. And uh, there's another um, aspect, as you all well know, uh, the system of press clubs, where um, large uh, media have access uh, to uh, information by uh, very large organizations, in including arms of the government. Uh, these, are, these press clubs are limited membership um, only to uh, prestigious large media. Uh, there are many Japanese journalists that cannot enter these press clubs. Uh, there are many foreigners uh, that cannot jo uh, join them. So if you are lucky enough to be uh, part of a major news organization and belong to a press club, you don't even really have to make much of an effort. You get information, very good information, handed to you on a constant basis. You are also given free access uh, to people and uh, to places that other people cannot. So it's a very, very... Um, uh, positive relationship and I think the mentality therefore f of the people who work for a uh, major media is that they are closer more to the government rather or to the people in power rather than to the average uh, person. There is not much of an awareness among members of the press that it is their job to look with very very sharp eyes at the workings of the government and to monitor for any kind of uh, misdeeds or wrongdoings. Uh, so and again uh, they also understand that uh, the idea of taking this power to uh, allot these media frequencies and media licenses uh, to the television stations from the government. If there were any movement to try to reform the system, if the media side were to say, let's set up an independent committee and have that committee handle it, then that would be something that would not just simply disturb or the government but would probably make them furious. And that is something, therefore, that the media would very much want to avoid. Excuse me. <clears throat> the question was from um, German uh, television, and basically, uh, she was the uh, questioner was saying that uh, I believe that your uh, work against uh, about speaking out uh, has begun uh, basically after you left uh, METI, uh, the ministry, and she was also referring uh, to his involvement when he was at METI with um, uh, a special deliberation committee uh, that was discussing energy issues under uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto, and uh, there were many discussions that were being held about how people at METI um, quite often had golf. 
Oh, uh, Osaka Hashimoto. Ah, excuse me, I'm sorry. I thought it was Prime Minister Hashimoto. It was Mr. Hashimoto, uh, the uh, mayor now of Osaka. Excuse me, uh, the head of the Restoration Party. Excuse me, closely affiliated with the Restoration Party, uh, and uh, about uh, the close relationship that the bureaucrats had with uh, the heads of um, utility companies. Um, but uh, I would like to say, first of all, that um, it is not that I have begun to speak out uh, ab about many, many things since leaving METI. It is because I spoke out very openly about everything that I uh, thought uh, that I had to leave METI. Uh, and one of the things, of course, that I'm very, very concerned about is not only this idea that we're talking about today about freedom of um, broadcasting, but also uh, energy issues. In other words, the, the um, nuclear uh, village uh, problem that we talk about quite often. And this is too huge a topic to go into detail today. But I would like to point out that the publisher Kodashan has issued uh, several novels, um, I think called uh, Nuclear Reactor Whiteout and Tokyo Blackout. And uh, the author is a man named Mr. Wakatsugi. 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 And it's actually um, a pseudonym. Uh, it's Tetsu. Letsu. It's Letsu Wakasugi, uh, and uh, he's using a pseudonym, but he's apparently an actually a, a, a ministry official. And uh, the reason that he has decided to write fiction novels rather than um, actual nonfiction books is that if he were to write a nonfiction book, and he goes into great detail about uh, the nuclear industry and many things that are, have happened, but if he were to write a nonfiction novel and a nonfiction book and come and make one small error, then it is obvious that he would immediately be uh, subjected to a lawsuit and probably would lose his job. And even though uh, authors have worked very, very hard to try to gather evidence about all of the things that have occurred, uh, this uh, system has been put into place for decades now, and there has been a concerted effort by people involved uh, to try to ensure that no evidence uh, basically uh, exists or is uh, available. Uh, if the true truth about the nuclear village were to eventually come out, it would have to be from the mouth of someone who was truly at the heart of this village, maybe perhaps one of the presidents of one of the major utility uh, companies. Uh, and that, I think, uh, uh, would be very, very difficult uh, to, uh, for, to, to, to be realized. Uh, what the media has done and what many journalists uh, has, have tried to do is to look at the circumstantial evidence and draw conclusions and basically put together uh, different stories. We know some of these uh, um, aspects of the truth, but we don't know everything. So again, uh, the nuclear village issue and also the freedom of press issue, these are things that I think need to be pursued. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, and before um, I end this, um, I, I've been, uh, I, I watch uh, Holdo Station uh, sometimes, and I know that uh, Furutachi san is probably watching, or he often uh, makes requests of people to come and speak. And so I would like to make a request for him to come and speak at the press club. We had been discussing having him come uh, before to talk about freedom of uh, expression and freedom of press issues. Um, and so aside from this, we would like to have him come if, he, if it's possible. Thank you. And so I would like to again thank our, our guest, um, uh, Mr. Koga, uh, for actually taking a fair amount of time actually going over uh, today and uh, having a far-ranging discussion on uh, freedom of expression, freedom of press issues and also what, what he's doing now and uh, what he's actually trying to do. Anyway, thank you very much. And as is our usual um, custom, we would like to give you an honorary membership for a year, but I think you already have one. Um, so I don't know what we do in that case. Uh, but anyway, I would like to give you another uh, one-year honorary membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.